Well, hello there. Welcome back, everybody. I hope you missed us. Uh, this is the second segment of Security <laughs> Live, a show that- Well, you didn't have to miss us for that long. I guess not. I guess not. But we're, we're coming live to you every third Tuesday of the month, 1 to 2 p.m. Pacific. This is our second segment. I'm Ryan Orsi, one of your co-hosts. This time, I'm just going to shorten my job title, Merritt. Like, yeah, I think you should. Otherwise, you just- I, uh, I get to work with really cool partner companies in security and cloud ops and disaster recovery. It's a fun job, and I'm in the AWS Partner Network. What, what more else can I say? Merritt, you want to give a little intro on yourself? Yes, I can't believe that you just rolled over this time. And yeah, I learned my lesson. It's too much. You can look me up on LinkedIn. It's a long <laughs> job. <laughs> um, hi, folks. Uh, my name is Merritt Bear. I am coming to you from Denver, where I'm on Ute, Southern Ute, uh, Kiowa, and Arapaho land, among others. I uh, work in the AWS office of the CISO, the Chief Information Security Officer here at AWS. And um, we are really excited today to have Brad from Proficio joining us. He is the CEO and co-founder. Hi, Brad. Hi, Brad. Good afternoon. Where are you coming in from? The atmospheric river in Southern California. I like you it. Um, both. What's going well, on here, Brad? They well, were swimming upstream, you know, just fighting the bad guys here at cybersecurity land. I like it. Folks who are listening, um, feel free to comment with where you're coming in from, and we can give you a review on it. <laughs> um, Brad, can you give us a quick uh, intro and uh, sort of a little bit on, you know, uh, Proficio's raison d'etre? Absolutely. And thank you very much. It's uh, great to be on Security Live uh, this afternoon. And I love the intro and the music. I feel almost like it's Saturday Night Live. So it's let's kinda, hit it. It's so, kinda, <laughs> so my name is Brad Taylor. I'm co-founder and CEO of Proficio. And we're a managed detection and response company. Uh, I've been in cybersecurity for about 30 years, uh, which you know dates myself a little bit. Uh, as a matter of fact, I remember when the first icon for a firewall was that little uh, graphic behind merit, an actual brick wall. So, you know, dating myself on, on the firewall icons. Anyway, so what Proficio does is a real one. It's real. <laughs> it's, we are a security operations center as a service. So, in you know, any enterprise or cloud environment, AWS uh, environment, you have a lot of security tools. Those security tools are enabled to help you to detect things that are happening and protect things uh, from your bad things from happening in your environment but somebody needs to monitor those 24 by seven and react to threats in your environment uh, by some type of cybersecurity response. That's us, 24 by seven security operations center as a service doing managed detection and response uh, with AWS. So you mean, you mean to tell me, Brad, just because I bought MFA and I bought some firewall stuff and I bought some endpoint stuff that I'm not, I'm not good to go. Someone has to actually go configure it properly, wire up all the logging traces and sources, do the analytics, respond to the alert, triage them. It's like a lot of work. Oh, uh, it's, it, you know what? I, I, the reason I started the company, I think, was out of guilt for that exact question because for the first 20 years of my career, it was selling all those products. So here's the product, set it up and forget about it. But they just don't work like that. You know, security solutions, guard duty and, and cloud trail and, and all of the other solutions inside of AWS that AWS provides a great tool set for or CrowdStrike and other vendors that are also in that environment, you set those tools up, but then you have to monitor the alerts that they provide to say what's gone through that. It's not a perfect environment, nothing really is. So somebody's always gotta be on, somebody's gotta be analyzing, investigating, looking at it, and then responding to those bad things that happen. So, you know, it's not a set it and forget it world, it's a somebody's gotta be looking, verifying, and, and doing something. Uh, and so we're that, that second half of the partnership. So you might, one might say, Brad, if I'm uh, kind of reading the tea leaves, it's not about what you have, tools, it's how you use them. <laughs> Stealing my line now? <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's a bit of that. It's not what you have, it's how you use it. Absolutely. So, you know, tools are great, but, you know, it's it's got to be managed. Uh, you got to have somebody that sets them up. And usually a security team's pretty good at setting up the tools, <clears throat> but you also have to allow communications and business to go through your environment. And so bad actors are looking to mimic things that look like real activities. And so you have to be able to, to wade through the, the river of all of that information, find the needles in the needles in the haystack, and then determine what to do about needles it. So in it's the needles a stack. triage and respond and then remediate and, and do the whole life cycle over again. 
Yeah, I want to back up a little bit, actually, just to even what you're talking about here, which is, I think there's, as we know with cloud, like there's so many sort of luxuries that you get where you can get authoritative logic around what you have. You can get, you know, the ability to toggle or to come back to a known good state, but like you still have to affirmatively make some of these judgment calls and they're going to be um, for lack of a better word, sort of like navigations where you want to keep things open enough that your devs can get stuff done and closed enough that you're prioritizing security or you can at least make intelligent judgment calls. You know, like I think that transition, the word automation is such a uh, buzzword, but like it has real manifestations and it's also a challenge. And so I think even writing those automations takes work. Um, can you talk a little bit about how your you know, enterprise looks or how you build on enterprises that are advantaging themselves through cloud, but it's still work. Can you tell me a little bit about what that looks like and how that transition has affected your business? And bonus points if you work in Sherlock Holmes for Sanjeev 22. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So there's, you know, there's, there's a mass migration to the cloud. Everyone wants to move applications to the cloud because of the scalability, the infrastructure capability, you know, all the, the amazing things that are afforded to uh, businesses as they move to that cloud environment. And so as you race to that environment, automation is king and automation and scale is going to, you know, help you to be competitively differentiated in the marketplace. And sometimes security will take a back seat to that. So when you're enabling communication, you're enabling, you know, ability for applications and businesses to communicate through that environment, sometimes you might misconfigure something. Sometimes the configuration uh, isn't accurate tomorrow as it may be yesterday because things change. Attackers are finding new ways around those. So you've got to be continuously adapting, continuously monitoring and continuously, you know, making responses and changes to that environment. There's things like, you know, best practices that you look at, but you have to monitor to make sure you've implemented in a best practice environment. Somebody comes in, makes a change and it resets back to what was, you know, kind of the base, but not the best practice. Uh, happens all the time. That's why we have vulnerabilities, you know, in, in different environments, vulnerabilities in, in containers. That's why we have misconfigurations that sometimes enable uh, attackers to come in. And then I don't even want to talk about containers, Brad. I look, I already have <laughs> a toddler. It, whatever it is, somebody's figured out a way around it. You know, I mean, the the nation states and the attacker communities are well funded, and they have all the tool sets that we have. And so they look to find, you know, uh, ways around those tool sets, whether it's two factor authentication, whether it's, you know, some type of intrusion detection system, or whether it's a web application firewall. Yeah, agreed. Great. We have a question for you from Kavasak um, asking whether you use white hat methods to figure out your um, security approaches. So great question. So, you know, doing penetration testing is a part of the stack and part of the services that you always want to take a look at. Uh, sometimes penetration testing can be a point in time. Uh, and it's always good to have, you know, a couple of major penetration tests, you know, during the year, but you also want to do a continuous evaluation. So the continuous evaluation is looking what ch at what changes in the environment and those anomalous changes may create new vulnerabilities. So that's more along the lines of what a white hat type of penetration testing will be doing is a continuous evaluation. We do some of that, but the majority of what we do is you have security control devices. We help you to manage those or co-manage those. And then we monitor the alerts from those, which are millions of alerts a day in, in virtually any environment to discover where the indicators of an attack indicators or compromise are, and then trace that down through investigation to determine what's actionable and then either telling you what action to take or taking that action on your behalf to contain the threat. So it could be, you know, isolating a component. It could be suspending, you know, an administrator account for some reason. Um, you know, it could be, you know, blocking a port, you know, on a firewall or a, a web application firewall. I was going to ask you, Brad, do, do companies generally allow Proficio the, the permissions in, say, their AWS account to go make these changes on their behalf when to, to isolate a threat or remediate? Or is that like, a proposed remediation and a customer can then kind of decide what happens when it happens, et cetera. Great question. And it's been a journey. When we started doing automated response about eight years ago, people said you're crazy. But what we looked at was if we give you a very specific 
uh, detection, known bad actor permitted through environment has command and control of this asset and you need to do X, Y, and Z, companies aren't 24 by seven in their response teams. And sometimes the person that's responsible for security isn't responsible for operations. So they create a ticket. Change management happens on Saturday. Well, it's Tuesday, you know, and somebody's got, you know, access, you know, as a bad actor to my environment. So you have to automate those response actions. What we've done is automate the response actions for high fidelity, you know, events that you know what you are going to do. And then for those other ones, we've created this concept of a playbook for response, which is if I see X, look for Y and then do Z. And the do Z can be integrated into the environment where we push the button in the security operations center, or we give you the alert notification with the information and you as the client push the button to make the action occur. So it's really about automation because there's just never going to be enough security professionals in the marketplace to do all that we need to do. So as you automate through the cloud, build in security with it and build in that automation. Yeah. Are you um, writing those or are you writing, like, are you suggesting WAF managed rule sets or are you writing custom ones or both? I mean, like, I'm just curious the degree of um, kind of off the shelf versus custom uh, automations that you're involved in. Uh, great question. So most security tools, you know, have a base set of, of rules that they come with and configurations, and then you configure them to your environment. So we help companies to do that, but we really aren't creating as much custom rule sets in the tools themselves as we are in the security information event management system that ties the tools together or within machine learning looks for, you know, uh, the, the, the patterns throughout the environment and the anomalies with that and then allows us to detect something tied to a, this is a bad event based on a rule set. So we're creating the rules for discovery of indicators of attack or indicators of compromise or something that is way out of bounds. Uh, and then we're responding to that with an investigation and an action. So it's not as much about creating the rules in the tools, the tools we just configure for their environment per se. Got it. Yeah, which makes sense because we might as well take advantage of the, you know, like, luxury of the tools as they exist today, you know. Um, Can you tell me more about the investigatory stage? Like, how are you, you know, it's kind of, um, I think, a a game changer that folks are doing, you know, like your forensics in the cloud are going to be your logging and monitoring. It's Mm going to feel different. Um, And by the same token, like, you're not going to get into the host. That's on our side. Um, You know, like, so tell me a little bit more about that stage and what that feels like. And and before you answer, like, it's probably not humanly possible to to address every single alert that your folks see. I know you use some technology and automation, but Maddie V from Hotlanta is bringing up a good point about how do you overcome alert fatigue? So I think that's probably related to what we're about to say there, Brad. Yeah. So, I mean, there's, you know, so what we do is we want to absorb the alert fatigue as a security operations center and not have it as our customer. And so a lot of what you do is you, you have to create rule sets for looking for those indicators and you want to then eliminate the false positives and then tune it to the individual business context of your customer themselves. So know what's known good, know what's known bad, learn over time and tune the rule sets to detect those things that are important to that individual customer and eliminate those things that are false positives so that I can investigate the ones that are meaningful. So that's how you begin to eliminate the alert fatigue. You could then apply some machine learning combined with static rule sets that then even you know quiet down the noise even more. But to answer the question of what is the security operations center, it's really people with you know four monitors, you know, or maybe two or three monitors. And they're playing war games, you know, with bad actors and and good people trying to figure out what's happening. And so if you see, you know, some type of an indicator, you want to, you know, maybe go look at a third party source to say, is this, you know, a bad location? Is it, you know, known to be a bad actor? Is it known to be a good location? Maybe it's just I I got an alert, but it's a, a healthcare application I've added that's looking for an end agent someplace. So it's a normal process. It's just new to my environment. So you continuously have to learn and adapt your rules to quiet the alert fatigue and focus on those things that are real. Yeah, I think that's actually one of the weird things about security is that like context matters. Oh, absolutely. For anomalies. So like sometimes the anomaly is the thing you want to, like any statistician will tell you you exclude the outliers. 
Right. And then, you know, and not, you know like insecurity, though, right? It, insecurity, the outliers. Yeah, but like you don't want your ML algorithm going all over the board just because you have one dot up here. And we still use statistics a lot of the time to identify outliers. And then we also have to care about them, you know? So it's kind of one of those interesting things. Right. I mean, it's it's both. I mean, sometimes, you know, when you ask about the investigation, sometimes looking at an outlier through a machine learning model or an anomaly or something is is related to what would be considered a zero day attack, something you've never seen before. So you're not asking the machine the question, the the machine is asking you a question, which is go investigate this. And so that kicks off what we call threat hunting often. So threat hunting is backtracing an anomalous event to say, is this something that is suspicious that we should do something about? Or is it really, you know, I, I should consider it normal activity. Yeah. Um, it, Our listener Sanjeev actually 2022 says um, he's wondering or they are wondering um, what your, what degree you use AI in your approach for anomaly detection. Yeah, AI is, is a value add to anomaly detection or to threat detection. I mean, you, you've really got to understand the customer environment. You've got to understand the security tools and how they operate. And then it's not just looking at one security tool, but it's looking at a combination of several. So what happened at the firewall? What happened at the agent? What happened at the application? And, and why is that something that is an indicator of a compromise instead of normal business? So understanding just to know coincidentally what, is, what password list is looking like these days too. Oh my God, I'll tell you a, 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 a total you know scare for our for credential abuse here in a second. Okay. But what we use machine learning is you know to a lot in authentication, a lot in network traffic like VPC flow to look yeah. at where things are going and how things are going you know through the cloud, and then look for some of the outliers where you know that shouldn't have happened. You know it was a random you know firing of something. So let's let's track that down. So machine learning, I would say, only detects about, you know, five to 10 percent of our overall alerts. But that five to 10 percent is critical because you catch things early on that you wouldn't have seen before. So it's important, but it's not the major thing that we're you know doing in, in threat detection. But on the credential side, what's funny today is we've seen an uptick of about 250 uh, percent compromises in credential abuse, which means that somebody has your username has your password and gets in on the first attempt. And a lot of things that are related to that is we see that, you know, corporate users are using their corporate email to then register at non-corporate websites. And then they just use the same password. And then that non-corporate website gets compromised. And if I'm an attacker, I just stream through that, eliminate all the Gmail, all the Yahoo, all the other stuff. Everything else is a corporate email. And then I just go to Office 365, bam, use the username and password, and I'm in. Uh, or you're deaf. Really or hard to detect. Yeah. Yeah. You I, sorry for my spring allergies, by the way. My eyes are like yeah. having one of those days. Do you ever have those? Anyway. I, 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 I do. thought you were getting really sad about the yeah, really sad. second day of spring and you're already <laughs> with the allergies. Um, I have allergies. Um, we have another question here. I don't mean to jump around too much, but our... Um, our listener Hart said, says, is Proficio more for large co- corporations or is it affordable to uh, small businesses? Thank you for that question. So we started out in uh, midsize and large enterprises uh, about 10 years ago, uh, thinking that, you know, companies that, you know, were over a certain level should have a security operations center and were under a certain level weren't getting attacked as much. That dynamic has all changed. Large companies are challenged with maintaining people and automation. So we are helping very, very large enterprises. And we take that information from what we learn. And through automation, now we're able to help smaller enterprises. So smaller enterprises are getting pounded from attackers. You look at you know, school systems who never used to get attacked are getting attacked on a daily basis. You know, small community hospitals, small community banks manufacturing facilities, you know, anything that can disrupt your business, people need to pay to make their business continue to operate. And attackers know that. So it, it's really challenging. Or companies say, I need cyber insurance. Well, to get cyber insurance, you got to have security controls, you got to have log collection and somebody monitoring 24 by seven. So right. we actually do support those small companies through a lot of our, um, you know, partners as resellers and, and managed service providers will, you know, sell our services you know, to, to those smaller business organizations. But it's the same proficio platform engine, if you will. Same thing. It, yeah. Same right. quality I mean, of service. I actually same tools. think this is one of the things that I talk to customers a lot about where I'm like, 
look, there is no way that you on your own would make the investments that we do into the security that we deliver the same way to a two person team as we do to the largest banks or the US government or any of the most sophisticated folks. Mm -hmm. And I think that is also like a real win for the security community because ultimately if we can do economies of scale and allow folks to benefit from the kinds of visibility and research and just like, you know, operational expertise that we've developed over decades, then, mm -hmm. you know, we, we raise the, the water level for everyone and, and raise that tide for all the boats. Exactly. I mean, we created the company as a Fortune 100 style security operations center offered as a shared service to many companies. And so that allows us to have that that large scale, but offer it to, you know, the masses. I mean, a security operations center at a minimum, you need, you know, something like 14 people for 24 by 7 monitoring. And, and companies aren't going to hire 14 people to stare at screens and, and do investigations. They don't need it, you know, but they would need it if they wanted to run, you know, around the clock. So as a shared services model, you know, we can offer that with hundreds of people, um, you know, looking at, at, you know, thousands of different companies. And I'm just going to throw a kudos to you and your company, Brad, because that's the statement you made about the enterprise grade security operations, but at scale to as many customers as you, as you can possibly wire up is why we actually sought out Proficio in the level one MSSP program. Oh, stop. <laughs> Love it, love it. Parent loves when I grab the sticker. She loves it. It's like her favorite part. Of the uh, you know, I, I love all the AWS t-shirts and everything. You know, I didn't wear one today, but I, I've got one on almost every day. And we were... Uh, Brad, you know how hard it is to get an AWS crypto shirt? That's pretty rare. I'm going to say oh, that. Oh, that's hard. That's hard. I'm being completely serious <laughs> you have to, it is, oh, it is, it's, it's in the swag uh you know brag trait yeah and, and i will plug if you need our services you can also go on marketplace so you know there's the best place to well uh, yeah and that's you know, acquire proficient that services actually, and learn more um, about us right we're gonna do we have a, a call to action uh link here ryan but i think that's a good Point. I mean, this should be really uh, easy for you to test out and deploy. And also, if you're, um, you know, availing yourself through Marketplace, it just goes seamlessly with your AWS bill. So you're able to just like, you know, make it a one click kind of thing. It's the whole kind of Amazon experience. And I think you're that's a real luxury. You're basically subscribing to Proficio's managed security service and it shows up in your AWS bill. I don't know how it gets easier than that. That's that's the, the best so the best sales cycle I, I know of. It's the streamline. <laughs> Click, we connect, and uh, then you just, you know, bill comes to you. And we're, we're here to consult with you as well. If you've got any questions, we're happy to have a conversation. We've got the consulting chair available here in my office. Yeah. So, you know, Elijah, we're, we're just... always open, always on, and always available. <laughs> just waiting. Nice. I like it. Um, well, awesome. Ryan, what should we ask Brad to... I've been, I've been thinking about this one. I mean... Oh. You know, Merritt and I, you know, we have to we have to fine tune our journalistic capabilities, Brad. So we, you know, we do off sites. We think about like compelling questions to ask. And, um, we were just going to kind of ask you as one of these, uh, uh, I think, the pinnacle of our journalistic career questions. No, no, none of this is true. We are total <laughs> armchair journalists. <laughs> I'm actually thinking of the question right now, if you can't tell. But uh, <laughs> I would I would love to know what your favorite winter vacation destination is and why favorite winter destination vacation um i would have to say favorite uh is is deer valley uh in utah so park city deer valley uh, i'm a skier not a boarder uh so you know you can ski deer valley it's got great slopes great restaurants uh you know fun town uh, you know, great, great ski environment, beautiful snow this year. It's absolutely amazing. So I would have to say, you know, skiing Deer Valley is probably, you know, my, my daughters, you know, rip right past me all the time. Sure. So it's fun to watch them, uh, you know, skiing and with all their friends and then, uh, you know, everybody ending up and, and having, uh, you know, a nice, uh, cocktail at the end of the day. Um, this is the first time that we've had a listener also ask you a written question, but we'll oh, do you play oh, golf? 
Are you a golfer? I I I love I love the uh, the camera on that one, but uh, yeah, I do play golf absolutely. So uh, I you know I enjoy golf in Southern California or any place any of our uh, clients want to play. Uh, okay. But yeah, absolutely. I, I don't. I guess I don't play enough. You know, being an entrepreneur and, and running a company, I've still got a double digit handicap. So you know, somebody can take a lot of my matchsticks. Well, and you should probably let the clients win the league. <laughs> <Yeah, it's> like... <laughs> yeah, we appreciate you just putting that on for them. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Or uh, another friend of ours who is with AWS, uh, you asked the question, you know, what his handicap is when he plays golf and he doesn't go by strokes. He goes by balls lost or balls found. So he's okay. either ball positive or ball negative when he plays golf. Is so he that's a how he determines a good round uh, if he's ball positive. He found finds more balls in the bushes than he lost and, and hacks them out there. I still think he might just be a Labrador, but okay. This is your um, okay. Well, Brad, this was too much fun. Um, and we'll have to do it again next time on the golf course, apparently. I think uh, that's a date. I think that's a date. Merit, so we have to come. We're happy to come to you, Merritt, but you know, we're both here in Southern California, so. Yeah, Miami has some courses. Miami's pretty good. Yeah. We could play in Miami. Absolutely. You know, I, I can make a trip to Miami. We can do that. Okay. This time of year would be nice. Well, wait a few weeks. It's spring break there right now. I don't want to be anywhere near Miami at this time of year. But I'm in yeah. Denver now, so you, we can we can pick. We'll figure right. out something good. Um, yeah, thank you for being here, folks. Thank you for tuning in. Um, lots of good comments and thanks for your interactions. You can find us um, online. This is my Twitter handle at Merit Bear, and you can find um, Brad and Ryan there with all seven of their followers too. Um, but oh, let me let me grab that one for you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just teasing. No, um, thanks so much, Brad, for being on. It's great to hear about Proficio and how you're problem solving for customers. I know that like it's such a cliche that workforce is the universal pain point, but I think economies of scale are always going to be how we do more with less and that better together. So thanks for chatting with us today and we'll talk to you soon. Hope to see you. Thank you very much. Take care.